Hello, everyone. Yeah. Um, my name is Guang Liang Pen. People also call me Ji Pen or Benny. Yeah. Uh, I worked for APN for 24 years. Uh, people also know me as uh, head of the host master at APN. And but since this year, I have left APN, uh, become an independent consultant on IPv6. IoT and AI. And today I am the moderator of this uh, Internet of Things both. Can I go back to the first time? Uh, no, yeah, okay. So why do we have uh, Internet of both? Internet of things um, is part of the future internet. And I believe it will be uh, based on IPv6. And all things can be connected to the internet, which including the electronic items or non electronic items and like uh, company asset or products. Um, today, I think AI is a very hot topic. And in the last 30 years, internet actually changed our life. But in the next 30 years, I believe AI will also change our life. And IPv6 actually support IoT and IoT also supports AI. So IoT actually connects the uh, APNIC with the future AI development. So this is the reason actually I want to bring IoT into the APNIC conference. And the objective of this uh, IoT Pro is to welcome everyone who is interested in Internet of Things come together to share the experience or case and like um, the ideas on Internet of Things. And of course, use of uh, IPv6 for Internet of Things. And this program is a one hour program and we'll start with a few experts to share the experience on Internet of Things and share the stories. And then we will discuss how APL can help to develop IoT in AP region as well. And IPv6 actually can provide a huge number of IP addresses. And IoT also lead a huge number of IP addresses, which actually can less the APNIC with the IoT industry. And at the moment, actually IoT industry not really use IPv6 at this stage, to be honest. But I want that to be collected and in the future internet and use IPv6 for IoT. And today we have uh, five speakers. The first speaker is uh, Kuf Liker. He is the founder and chair of the New Zealand Internet of Things Alliance. And he will talk about the Internet of Things um, Alliance in New Zealand. And I met him in Auckland last week, but unfortunately he has to be travel overseas this week, so he couldn't be here. And he recorded a video presentation, so I will play it later. And the second speaker is Guo Liang Yang. He is the director of IPv6 lab in Songan, New Area, China. And he will talk about IoT application scenario in Songan. It is a smart cities like IoT use. 
And then the stress speaker is Wei Wang. He will tell you a very interesting story about using IPv6 for non electrical items. So this probably new to you, but it will be a very interesting presentation. And then we have Ching Han Ku from TWA, and he will talk about the IoT for smart healthcare in Taiwan. And the last speaker will be Myler. He will uh, talk about the IoT in Tonga. He is the security engineer at Tonga Communication Corporation. And so um, after the, all the speaker, we will have a quick discussion on like uh, how APL can help uh, develop IP, IoT in AP region. And also should we have future IoT session or forums in the future uh, APL conference. Okay, so now there, um, let's start with the first speaker that will be playing a video from like a pre pre recorded because he couldn't make it today. So he is in overseas now. So yeah, please play the video for the first speaker. Thank you. Kota. Good afternoon. My name is Kriv Nyka. I'm the founder and chair of the New Zealand Internet of Things Alliance. And it's a pleasure to present an introduction to the NZ Internet of Things Alliance at APNIC 58. Today I will discuss the incredible opportunities that the Internet of Things presents for New Zealand. The New Zealand Internet of Things Alliance is part of the wider New Zealand Tech Alliance which is a collection of purpose-driven, not-for-profit, non-government associations that focuses on the collective impact of technology across New Zealand. The NZ Tech Alliance's purpose is to bring together a diverse community of IoT innovators, investors, government regulators, researchers, educators, and social entrepreneurs. By connecting these groups, we can generate synergy and drive meaningful and measurable change. Sister associations of the New Zealand Internet of Things Alliance include the Artificial Intelligence Forum of New Zealand and Agritech New Zealand. The New Zealand Internet of Things Alliance Charter is based on three pillars, connecting, promoting, and advancing. We aim to foster and facilitate IT ecosystem relationships by connecting the community measuring, understanding, and promoting the opportunities and challenges raised by IoT as our next key pillar. Through this, we aim to identify and promote value-driven use cases of IoT in New Zealand and support mature and emerging New Zealand IoT businesses. And the third pillar centers around advancing regulation and advocacy, advancing talent attraction and development, advancing collaboration and innovation, and advancing and stimulating economic growth and public benefits. So why is IoT important for New Zealand? Advancing economic and social outcomes are the heart of our mission. We believe that IoT has the potential to stimulate economic growth, enhance public benefit, and improve the quality of life for all New Zealanders. By advancing talent attraction and development, we can ensure that our workforce is equipped with the skills needed to thrive in this rapidly evolving landscape. Collaboration and innovation will be key drivers in achieving these outcomes. A few years back, the New Zealand IoT Alliance commissioned a research study to forecast economic benefits over the next 10 years based on the greater use of IoT across our industries and sectors. 
The net result of this research forecasted that the overall economic value that accelerated uptake of IoT could bring to New Zealand is estimated to be significant. The potential net benefit for New Zealand over a 10 year period is approximately 2.2 billion New Zealand dollars. This forecast reflects the cumulative economic impact of various sectors leveraging IoT technologies, indicating a substantial opportunity for growth and efficiency improvements across the economy. We forecasted the estimated net economic benefits of IoT across a range of use case scenarios, from transport and logistics, to city infrastructure maintenance, to horticulture. In conclusion, the IoT landscape in New Zealand is filled with potential. By bringing together various stakeholders, we can create a robust ecosystem that drives economic growth and addresses social challenges. New Zealand is uniquely positioned to capitalize on the IoT revolution. With our strong emphasis on innovation, a supportive regulatory environment, and a collaborative spirit, we can lead the way in IoT adoption. The opportunities are vast from agriculture to healthcare. And collectively, we can harness the power of IoT and IoT data and insights for a more prosperous New Zealand. Thanks for your time. Kia ora. Okay, thank you. And then we move to the last speaker, Guo Liang Yang. Dr. Guo Liang Yang, please. And then to save time, I probably just uh, if he, um, follow the order and yeah, one by one to do the speaking, all the speakers. Yeah, thank you. Ladies and gentlemen, I'm Yang Guoliang from uh, Xiong'an IP Business uh, Lab. It's my pleasure to showcase IoT deployment over IP Business in Xiong'an. <laughs> 20 years ago, I worked at uh, China Telecom, focused on IP network construction and IP technology research, where I deeply understood the necessity of IP research. Ten years ago, I found a company to provide IPv6 upgrade solution. This experience made me uh, realize that the difficulty of IPv6 evolution is application upgrade. Four, four years ago, I started working for a government lab. Uh, during this uh, period, I had to think about why IPv6 was used. From, uh, from the perspective of urban governance and industrial de uh, development. Mm -hmm. Next, I will focus on <clears throat> IoT uh, deployment over IPv6 in Xiong'an, which includes uh, IPv6 home IoT appliances. IPv6 smart charging uh, station and remote uh, management of home IoT meters. Uh, at that time, we received a task uh, requiring family to implement uh, IPv6, but there were almost no IPv6 home appliances. Between giving up or opinion and waiting, we chose to develop uh, it ourselves. At the same time, we found uh, that the uh, home application, uh, home app, uh, appliances based on IPv4 are prone to leaking user privacy. We, with different standard, different uh, brands and different apps, lack of leaking, uh, lack of Linkage between bands and no levels of scenario and intelligence.
Therefore, we work with home appliance manufacturers to not only in implement IP visits, but also we construct the uh, entire te technical um, technical architectures, implement a unified standard interface, reduce uh, private data on the cloud, and directly connect to the mobile phones. Finally, using the government uh, talent apartment project, we form a demonstration uh, is experiment of uh, 2,500 sets, which is uh, uh, currently running well. Another task uh, requires uh, that all charging stations implement IPv6 and different operators uh, can share a unified app. Because there are uh, no uh, ready-made IPv6 charging stations, we can only choose to develop them ourselves. When we designing the technical architecture of a charging station based on IPv6, we found that IPv6 free the charging station stations from the constraints of private networks and apps could directly connect to the charging station. So we rectify the network interface of charging station and develop an open station, uh, open station access platform and universal uh, chips and modules to facilitate uh, manufacturers to quickly uh, produce the products uh, we need. We are going to set aside an area in Xiongnan to trial the new IPv6 charging station on a large scale. And we can foresee that the decentralization and the platformization uh, characteristics of IPv6 we need to a major change in the business model of charging station. And produ production and uh, operation companies will also face a uh, reshuffle. We also have a task to IPv6 water, uh, electricity, uh, gas, and heat meters. But we also have almost no corresponding IPv6 product. So we can only work with meter uh, manufacturers to, to develop it. During this period, we found that there are many ways to access lab meters. So we also unify the way to read meter data and, and the level interface. At present, we are replacing 50,000 households in, in the rest, uh, residential areas in Xiongnan one by one. After using IPv6, we found that the interaction between meters with a different function and different system is much more convenient. And it's easier to build new application scenarios. In summary, although, although it is well known that IPv6 realized the uh, interconnection of all things, we have truly felt the convenience brought by IPv6 in the uh, specific uh, practice in uh, Xiongnan. We hope that by sharing our experience, everyone will not stop because of the difficulties at the beginning. Thank you.
No worries. It seems uh, we need to wait a bit for a couple of seconds. Uh, the slides will be recruited. Good. Thank you, everyone. Uh, hi. Uh, good afternoon. Uh, uh, Today I'm gonna to make a presentation about the uh, uh, IPv6 for non-electronic item. I mean, basically, uh, what I'm gonna do is to introduce how to help the IP owner to apply to apply the IPv6 address to the web page associated with non-electronic item. Uh, I prepared like ten slides to explain our idea. First of all, I would like to make a quick uh, self-introduction. Many, many friends here know me as a DNS man. I work. I used to work in Cynic, and I also served in INA PDI for three years. Basically, I'm a DNS man. But in recent years, I'm also working on the uh, IPv6, and I'm uh, granted as the uh, IPv6 Forum Fellow last year. So uh, this slide is about the uh, all the uh, ID identification identifiers used for the uh, IoT. I mean, at the physical layer, la layer the, we have uh, uh, you know we have the MAC address for the uh, for, we have Ethernet MAC address, we have Bluetooth, we have RFID or MAC addresses. Uh, this is a kind of a physical identif identifiers. Basically, IETF EF is in charge of this kind of, this kind of work. At the, at the network layer, the, we have routable ID of course, the IPv4, the IPv6 address, and we have different kinds of object ID. Uh, some users use the, use the domain name as the uh, object ID, and some others might make commando or ID ID as one more code, and some, some enterprise users or manufacturers actually use their own private ID. But at the, at the uh, upper layer, uh, uh, anyway, if you want to access this information, you need to generate a URL, which is, is global accessible, and, and uh, the, the, which is our URL to enable the users to access the information in which the URL is. Okay. So then so you can tell that we have electronic devices and also the non-electronic uh, non -electronic, uh, items. They all need the identifier. This is the this is the, the, the another uh, example. We have a smart device here. It's a it's a, it's a electronic camera, and basically there is a Wi-Fi model embedded in this device. Of course, it support the IPv6 protocols, so it will generate the IPv6 address based on this MAC address. You know, mapping the uh, 48 MAC address to the 64-bit uh, uh, IPv6 address. Over the IPv6 address, the camera will communicate with its backend system to transfer the daily video information to the database. Okay, so the IPv6 address is a routable address. But on the other side, at the bottom of the device, there is QR code and barcode, which is enable the users or managers to access the information in the database. Which means, besides the IPv6 address, help the device communicate with the system. There's another kind of label or identifier which will enable the manager or, con or consumer to communicate to access the information with the with, with, with the database. Though the, both of them are required, but the problem is a challenge to the. I'm sorry, but the challenge. Is the challenges to the non-electronic items are, they basically are not universal accessible. So there are two options to realize the universal accessibilities. The first one is to, you gotta provide the manager or consumers with that specific tour. So you gotta rely on a dedicated client tour to recognize the semantic in the item and access the corresponding information. The second option is that you gotta uh, uh, put the identifier into a URL, like this handle. Right, the blue one is a, is a, is a handle. But if you want to access the information, 
beside behind the the the, the, the identifier, you gotta input a domain name in front of it to assemble a URL, which will enable the users to access. So for this kind of URL, then there were some five challenges. The first is that the, the, the semantic exposed it to everyone. So it is easier to the counterfeiter to fake the URL. Uh, the, the internal management information is exposed to everyone. And uh, for the manufacturer, uh, they have to be in, uh, dependent on external third party to realize a query. First, the DNS. The second, may, maybe they're, they, they got to rely on the, the, on the handle system. And the handle system basically is managed by CNRR or some other uh, authoritative uh, organizations. And uh, for a manufacturer, they probably have different uh, multiple identifiers. Some is compliant with the local government requirement, but some are private ID only works in the factory. So they need a competitive uh, uh, co compatibility to among multiple identifiers across diverse system. And the last and the most important that the label need to be verified by a authoritative organization. Uh, if the label could provide a self verify ability, that would be much better for the uh, manufacturer or vendors. So the demand, so in sum, the demand from the enterprise user is that they need an access entry query code for every single item, which will direct to distinctive homepage for every single item. So, so to different not so different item uh, access code, different homepage, uh, and this code should be uh, supposed to be compatible with all existing various types of identifier. Of course, I mean, the manufacturer or vendors, they already have a uh, existing system. They don't want to abandon the system just to in introduce a new one. So need, need this one to be compatible with all existing types of identifier. The second, they need massive amount of identifier because the, they have massive product, right? And, uh, this code is better be unique and random encoding to get rid of the risk of counterfeit. And they need a independent get query gateway, which is controlled by the enterprise itself, instead of they have to put everything into a third party system. But this system, the gateway system, also should be interactive with the third party system. The fourth is uh, they need a global accessibility regardless of the or, or operating system or application software, which means they don't need to install any extra plugin or extra software to support this access entry. The last one is the ability to self-verify the or authentic, or, or authenticity uh, to once you access the code, the code itself, maybe there should be a mechanism to enable the code itself to tell you, I am the real one, I am true, I'm not fake. So that's why we introduced the IPv6. I mean, if we look back to the history of IPv6, we already know that IPv6 at the very beginning was designed to configure on a electronic device, is on a, on a bare metal NIC, the network inter interface card. But we all know that then we have many virtual entity, right? Besides the bare metal, we have virtual NIC, we have virtual host, we have uh, a VM, we have container. The IPv6 could be, a, of course, uh, IPv6 address could be assigned to the cluster pod and services. And some other people, they uh, they have done a job to generate the IPv6 based on the EPC identifier, like to transfer the RFID ID to IPv6 address. And uh, then there's another, some other people, they are research on the, they are researching on how to generate the IPv6 based on the content name, use the MD5 to trend, to, to mapping the content uh, feature into an IPv6 address to enable the administrator have a better control of the traffic to the content. 
And the last paper is a very interesting one to use a, a IPv6 Bitcoin uh, address to prove the to 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 provide the trustful uh, address for the wallet for the Bitcoin wallet. So we can see the IPv6 could be used for everything. What about the IPv6 address for non-electronic item ID? So it's very simple. Given that we already have all these solutions, uh, the IP owner itself, if it happened to be a manufacturer, if the manufacturer have the IP, have a have a have an IPv6 uh, address, it could mapping its existing DOI or GS1 or private ID into the last 46 interface ID. Then this IP address could be printed on the uh, box or be embedded into the RFID, whatever. You scan it or you, you read it. Then the users could access the information with the, IP, the distinctive, the unique IPv6 address. The traffic will be sent to the, of course, it's, it's BGP router, right? And then to the LAN switch, to the gateway. Then at last, it goes to the file server, to the application system. So all this solution is confined with the uh, IETF standards framework. There's nothing new. There's nothing new. And it has been deployed by the, the local customers on their IPv6 addresses in both experimental and live network environments. So the benefits of the solution is that then now the manufacturer or the vendors, they have massive non-sequential address. It depends on the mapping algorithm. It could be generated the random non-sequential address. And the address itself is the uh, access identification. I'm sorry, there's a spelling, <laughs> it's an error. It's access identification. The routing pass is a verifi verification pass because the traffic is supposed to be sent to the IP owner's BGP router. And in the ISP, we we'll work with the uh, IP owner to prove that the traffic is true. Not to mention that the RPKI, the APNIC is trying to deploy, right? And that the query flow, I mean, the query flow at the application layer is the traffic flow at the network layer. And that the pack, all the packets will be sent to the gateway, then will be redirected to arbitrary upper layer ID system or application system. It depends. It depends on what kind of system the IP owner wants to send the query to. The last one, the global acceptance and the reachability, because it seems that globally, we have a pretty good uh, support to the uh, IPv6. Okay, so, so far the solution enabled the IPv6 enterprise users to make full use of IPv6 stress to build up a self-managed system for item identification and tracing. There's nothing new still. Uh, but there are three outstanding issues. I mean, so far, any IP owners, enterprise owner, could apply this solution very easily. With, with, but there are still three outstanding issues. The first one is, if the enterprise user are supposed to take the very conservative plan or take a very aggressive plan, the most conservative uh, conservative plan is to keep the first 46 prefix unchanged, which means it's a host address, but only mapping the item ID to the last 46, the interface ID. The aggressive plan is to assign, uh, keep the first maybe 32 or 48, it depends, the network ID, unchanged, but make full use of like 40, uh, 96 or 100, it depends It depends on the uh, IP owners, it's on decision. This is, this is the first question. The second question is that the routing pass could be secured by, IP, uh, by RPKI or BGPSEC, but how do we know the IP generation, the IP, IP address itself and is that the ownership of the IPv6 could be secured. So there were two technologies to enhance the security and trustworthy for, for the solution. The first one is to make to, to make you leverage the CGA. I mean, CGA was created, was invented 
is 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 for send pro protocol is is to find a public signature key to the IP, ipv6 address in send we tentatively employ uh, the original iot id as a parameter i'm sorry as a uh, uh, what's a parameter okay okay as a modifier per parameter and along with some other parameters to generate a IoT IPv6 address by CGA generation method, which means we don't need to introduce any, we don't need to design our own algorithm. We just need to use the, C, the existing CGA algorithm and, and introduce uh, the, the, the key, the public key and the private key. Of course, in that case, the user's query is, for the, uh, is supposed to include an encrypted token uh, derived from the IoT ID and the, uh, secured by the private key, I mean, at the, the uh, application layer. layer. The second, dress, uh, the second thing is to secure the, the solution is the Mac for user RPK and RTA. RPK, we, already, we all know what is RPK and RTA is also mentioned in the uh, uh, MPNIC block. It's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a kind of a, uh, not only sign the who is information, but also sign any related uh, file about the ownership of the RPK. Of course, we could include, I'm sorry, we could include the IoT item description, the IoT usage, the item lifecycle, the, the, the necessary, the productive uh, graphs in the, in the file and, uh, and, and, and add it into the RPKI uh, database. Uh, to sum up, it was claimed like 20 years ago when IPv6 was introduced. It, it was claimed that every grain of sand in the world could be assigned to a IPv6 address. But in practical sand in the desert, or bitch does not need a IPv6, and it can, cannot. You, basically, we are not able to configure a IPv6 onto a send because send it has no any inter uh, electronic devices. But once the send is packaged or transferred into a product item like a travel travel souvenir or a construction raw material or toy, then it became a product, commercial product. It needs identification. And you may require the IPv6 address to for identification to and provide the access entry to the information. And remember that the APNIC, I mean all RRR and ITF, they already spent 20 years to build up a trustful infrastructure of IP. We have RPKI, we have Hui system, we have BGP SEC. So our implementation is to make full use of this, all these technologies and infrastructure to enable the IP owners to assign the IPv6 to not only the electronic devices, but expand the usage to the non-electronic item. So that's all. Thank you. The sandstorm is coming. Uh, actually, we have generated the millions of IPv6 addresses uh, in the solution and uh, millions of IPv6 addresses have been released to the market. Some of them are written into the QR code. Some other are embedded, are written into the RFID. It depends on the scenario. Thank you. Yeah, thank you, Dr. Wong, for the interesting speech. Uh, is, is there any question? Okay, there's a question. So, so that's why. Depending on the answer, there may be several questions. Yeah, I think I'll have a simple or quick question yep. before we move on. Yeah. So, yeah. Uh, Dave, APNIC, but speaking yeah. my own personal capacity as a network yeah. engineer. Um, when we're talking about using uh, IP address space for non-electronic items, yeah. we're going against RFC 2640, which said things have to be connected. RFC 8200 kept going with that. So... Should this not go to IETF and get them to change the definition of what IPv6 gets used for? Uh, I think, basically, I think the, uh, the, the market goes in front of the protocol. I mean, at least in, in, in this scenario, our customer, the customer reach out, reach out to us yeah. and we help them to generate, to, 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 to generate the IP addresses to address their issues. And it works. 
uh, we'd like to share our, the, our users with the uh, engineers, and we, we and we like we would love to bring it to APNIC and to ITF to see if there's any specific, any extra, you know, uh, research or, or draft that should be should be discussed. So, so we go back one step from there, right? I'm scanning a QR code on a device that takes me to a web page mm -hmm. that validates the authenticity of this device mm -hmm. or this thing, right? That's a web page. It's a static web page. Mm -hmm. What's to stop somebody from just printing that QR code onto anything? You're, you're talking about using CGAs, okay? So cryptogra cryptographically generated addresses mm -hmm. are based around a hashing function that is uh, well, a function that is well known plus a hash. So how are you how are you guaranteeing the authenticity of the device based on an IPv6 address? Good question. Actually, our solution is not designed to replace the existing IDs, mm. but it will work more like the entry code for the end users to go first. So if, if I mean, if the device, if the end user's device support IPv6, well, the we entry will call, go to we again. We're calling it a device, okay? Because we're talking about something that isn't connected. A device for me as a mm -hmm. network engineer is something that is connected to a network. Mm -hmm. You're talking about things that are not connected to a network. Yeah. But so it, it's not a device at that point. I mean, it depends on if the users trigger the um, trigger the uh, access to that URL. Basically, the IPv6 address is only a code. If we don't trigger it, it's just a serial number. It's a, it's a 180 bits label. Uh, 120. There, there's no difference with other IDs. But if you trigger it with HTTP or some other protocols, it depends on how the uh, IP owner will, would like to embed but, it into a URL. But it's, then ju it's is... just a URL. It's a web page. Mm -hmm. yes. 16 billion V6 addresses in a slash 64, mm -hmm. 65,000 64s in a 48, 65,000 48s in a 32. Mm -hmm. That's a lot of addresses. Even if you CGA that at a reasonable hash rate, it's still a lot of addresses. There's a lot, and, and there's a lot of uh, information. Yeah. I mean, the uh, manufacturer or the vendors they have billion, they have millions of product to release to the market. They want every single market, uh, they want every single product to have their own homepage, and and, and they all and they also want every hosting whole homepage have a single code access code, yep. which will help the users to access. How many, people, how many people are in the world? Uh -huh. How many people are in the world? It depends on how many products are released, they produce. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. I think we probably have one hour of time. Uh, but I, actually, it's a very interesting topic and actually it generated a lot of discussion uh, on the mailing list as well. We have a policy proposal about this uh, using IPv6 uh, for uh, non electrical items. But we actually changed to uh, um, informational presentation on Friday. So come to Friday's session. So we will show you more and expand you how it works and how it secures. Um, now I think uh, we need to move to the next speaker, Ching Hang. Yeah, uh, before we finish uh, by seven, I don't hold you on for the social event. Yeah, so Ching Hang, please. Hey, thanks, uh, good evening, everyone. I'm uh, Jin Hen from TWNIC. Uh, I, uh, my, I'm Jin Hen Gu. Uh, my presentation topic is the IoT for smart healthcare. It's uh, just uh, some uh, information uh, sharing. And uh, this is a, a general IoT architecture. It uh, has uh, three parts. The first part is the machine-to-machine -machine, the area network. Uh, the second part is the the machine-to-machine the, -machine, the core network. Uh, the third part is the machine-to-machine -machine, the application. And uh, uh, what's the uh, Internet of Medical Sims, the IOMT? 
the IOMT I refer to a network of uh, connected devices and that communicate the health related data over the internet. And uh, these devices include a uh, wearable sensor, medical uh, equipment, and the home monitoring system. And the uh, light provide real time health data, data and uh, enable remote monitoring and the uh, management of patients. And uh, uh, this is a uh, three layers reference the IOMT uh, architecture. The low uh, layer is the uh, include uh, non medical environment and uh, is with the less number of medical uh, devices. And uh, it also has some uh, specialized uh, medical environments there with the uh, more uh, involvement of medical staff. And uh, the uh, median layer is the edge node, uh, the higher layer is the cloud uh, platform. And uh, I uh, introduced some uh, IOMT devices. And the uh, IOMT devices include a wide range of connected medical uh, devices and assistance. And the light are used to monitor, uh, diagnose, and the three patients. This device collect, uh, transit, and uh, analyze health data uh, in real time and providing the critical insight to healthcare provider. And uh, I list uh, some uh, IONT devices that uh, uh, require network uh, connectivities. The first category is the wearable uh, health devices, uh, such as the uh, smart watch and the fitness the trackers. And uh, these devices, the transit data uh, like the heart rate and the uh, activity level uh, to uh, apps or cloud platform. The second uh, category is you know, remote patient monitoring devices, uh, such as the blood uh, glucose uh, monitor. Uh, this device uh, uh, transit blood sugar data uh, to healthcare providers. Uh, the, the others, the blood pressure monitors, monitors uh, this device the send the blood pressure uh, readings. And the pulse uh, oscillator, uh, this, they, they send the uh, blood oscillator and the pulse data uh, to the remote monitor system. And the, the third uh, category is the smart uh, inhaler. Uh, this device is uh, check the usage and the monitor the respiratory data. The fourth uh, category is the connect, connected uh, image devices, such as the MRI machine and uh, the X-ray machines. And uh, these uh, large devices uh, uh, connect to the hospital networks and all cloud platform to enable the remote access and analyze the of images. Uh, the fifth the category is the smart impulse and uh, such as the pulse makers. Uh, some advanced uh, pulse makers can transit the data uh, to the uh, healthcare providers. Uh, the others uh, such as the neural stimulators and uh, these devices uh, send the data for remote monitoring and uh, adjustment. And uh, the sixth the category is the uh, medication management devices, such as the smart uh, peer uh, dispensers and the connected uh, impulse pumps. And uh, these devices uh, management medication uh, schedule and uh, transmit uh, data uh, for remote monitoring and uh, adjustment. The seventh category is the telehealth devices, such as the telemedicine kits or the connected uh, CMR meters. Uh, this device also send uh, temperature data to the healthcare providers. The S, the uh, Category is the smart hospital base. Uh, this base uh, monitor and the transit the patient data, such as the uh, movement and the, the vital signs uh, to a central monitoring assistance. And the, the key components of IMMT include the devices and the sensors. 
and the connectivity and the data management uh, systems. And the uh, uh, I did some applications of the uh, IOMT. The first uh, is the chronic uh, disease management. And uh, this is this application uh, is a uh, very important for a wide range of people. So IMAT uh, devices uh, are used to monitor uh, patients uh, with uh, chronic conditions and uh, provide alert and the data uh, that help uh, manage uh, their health uh, effectively. And uh, the second uh, application is a remote patient monitoring. This can enable healthcare provider to monitor patients' uh, health uh, metrics from the uh, distance now to reduce the need uh, for frequent uh, in-person visit and uh, improving the patient's convenience. And the uh, uh, three application, the third application is the enhance the diagnosis and the treatments. So our uh, IOMT devices uh, end in diagnosis uh, by providing uh, accurate, accurate and uh, tiny data now uh, which support a better decision making uh, and the person personalize the treatment uh, plans. And the benefit uh, of uh, uh, IOMT uh, such as the improved uh, patient's uh, outcomes and the increase the eff efficiency and the, uh, the cross uh, saving. So uh, they still have some uh, challenge and the consideration. The first is the data sec security and the privacy. And the, because the IOMT system must uh, adhere to strict uh, data security standards and the regulations. And the uh, interoperability is also uh, a challenge. And uh, the third is the reliability and the accuracy because the, the devices need to provide the accurate and the reliable data uh, is essential for effective patient management and the treatment. And the uh, conclusion is the IOMT uh, impact on the healthcare. The IOMT is uh, transforming the healthcare by providing real-time data and the enable uh, more care and uh, addressing the associated challenge and the leverage the emerging te technologies uh, with further advance the uh, benefit of IOMT. And thanks for your listening. It's all my presentation. Thank you very much.